everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Confab Experience. Uh, welcome, ladies. Welcome, listening audience. We're glad you're here. Um, this week's episode, I thought um, we would talk a little bit about something that not many people are really talking about today, and that is um, being Black in America. <laughs> <laughs> so, so as we know, there's a lot happening right now in America with race relations. Um, and we just thought we would touch on some, some subjects because it's relevant and especially relevant to us as women of color. So um, that good with you guys? Yeah, let's do it. Ready, I'm ready right. for it. I'm here for it. All right. Um, so one thing I know I wanted to speak on because um, I think we wanted to get this in our education episode, but we just kind of ran out of time. Um, but a debate that has been raging in the higher education space for mm. decades now is the HBCU versus PWI debate. So historically black colleges and universities versus predominantly white institutions. And um, you know, people who go to HBCUs feel a type of way because they say people who go to PWIs aren't black enough. Um, and then people who attend PWIs sometimes say, well, it like opens up you know, networking opportunities and um, things like that. So I was hoping as there are three of us who attended a PWI and one of us who attended an HBCU, um, if we could, you know. Chat about it. Jab a little bit. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, we jumping right in, huh? Uh, that's exactly oh, yeah. what I was thinking. I was <laughs> like, oh, okay. I thought there would be more of a warm up question. <sighs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Monique, I'm going to start with you as our resident HBCU grad. Okay, yes. What is the question that I most want? To well, I don't think that we could say, I don't think anybody should say at least that you're less Black if you choose one versus the other. I think that that's a ridiculous point, I, I believe anyway. Um, I do think that there that HBCUs are as relevant today as they've they've been when they were first established, even though they were kind of, um, you know, first established because black people could not get into PWIs. Well, they were just WIs. WIs. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, so that's why, you know, they were established in the beginning, but I think now is still just as important for us to have uh, education that uh, that is rooted in our own history, taught by people who look like us, and having the background of of of, of the black experience. Mm -hmm. Do you really not think that people don't think that if you go to an HBCU, you're like your your black card is just a little bit more accessible, like it's just like a little bit further out of your pocket. Like you just have earned it of just a little bit more. Like I feel like there's like a secret handshake that all HBCU <laughs> grads do. have. We do. Yeah. Like okay. That. So no. like <laughs> that's not. <No. laughs> I, I think there's just a, an experience that that HBCU share that's not. But I don't think that it's you know more black or less black. It's just a shared experience. Like people who live from a uh, in a certain part of the country you live in a city like you listen to the same kind of music you have a shared experience but it doesn't make one better or whatever than the other tell me about the experience right like would you say the experience here's here's my thought oh it's a safe it, space is it a safe space We're it's just the four of us it's and like <laughs> our it's million viewers by now whatever time this episode runs I think we're yeah. probably gonna have million viewers by <laughs> right now. okay so we're about to find out how safe it is so is the safe or sorry is the experience an experience rooted in like um like is it a precursor to the hardships that you're gonna have to experience in life for instance like I feel like there is such a funding issue with historically black colleges and universities that that you get the experience of all the people and the friends, but is there a little bit of a disadvantage of like the resources that are available to you? Um, Siobhan and I were talking about when we went to visit Howard and we like Howard is one of 
the most well-known black schools. And we had, we were in our first year at Carolina and it just felt like things that we were taking for granted Mm -hmm. just weren't like there. Mm. And when I think about like my friends who have attended um, HBCUs, um, not, not yourself, the the people have had to stop school because the funding hasn't been there and it's taken them years to complete what should have been four years because the finance like the systems that are set up or that are in place are so like um they're 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 so archaic like even even having to register for classes looks different than at like at like the least of a pwi and so for me it feels like there's a little bit of a disadvantage if we're not just talking about the people, but like the institution itself. I think that there is, I think that that is what people like to like push out there. Like that's the, that's what you hear about. But I don't think that that is, I don't think that that is like the the biggest thing that you get when you go to uh, HBCU. And one of the issues, I, I think one of the issues is we have these these uh, institutions, these colleges, these universities that have so much rich history, yet they do have a lot of funding issues and there are a lot of funding issues. But I think that we need to come to the, like, what is the real issue? It's, it's, it's all about the same systematic racism that is keeping like black people from, you know, getting to the higher levels. It's the same kind of systematic racism that affects HBCUs as well. So instead of right. being like, well, those those colleges are not are subpar or they don't, you know, provide the same kind of experience or the can't the same, they don't have the same resources, I think that we should, you know, I'm saying we as like black folks should sure. be um figuring out how we can pour into so that we can make sure that these things that are rooted in our history remain sustainable and remain on top of the game. Yeah, I think um, you're, you're right, because there is a difference between, you know, someone who goes to Carolina and whose father went to Carolina and grandfather went to Carolina and all the way back, all the way back to the early 1800s um, and that money rolling downhill and being donated generation after generation after generation when clearly- Endowments, endowments. Oh, exactly. Endowments like at PWIs are way right. different from right. you know, contributions that people who graduate from HBCUs are able to do. Right. Um, not that not the Carolina gets much of my money, <laughs> but whatever. The phone um, you ain't never donate to the phone <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they have my number actually. Um, but, um, <laughs> I, so I think it's cool that the this five-star high school basketball recruit has decided to go to an HBCU. Have you guys heard this? Mm-hmm. No. I haven't. No. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Haven't. He's like like the I think one of the most top-ranked players to ever commit to playing at an HBCU, and now all of these professional basketball players are like, "Yes, bro," who all went to PWIs, by the way, because they were like, "This is where you get the exposure." Right. I'm trying to go in from a first year, maybe win a championship, come out and make a million dollars in the NBA. Um, but they are all like pushing and everyone's saying, yes, more basketball players need to go to these HBCUs, get more exposure, get more money, more donations, just more revenue coming into the schools. So it'll be interesting to see, especially in kind of the climate of what's happening right now, if this becomes like a watershed moment where people actually start saying, yeah, I'll play basketball at Hampton or play football at Morehouse. I saw that. Football. They were talking about how much money football, um, you know, football, uh, what are they called? Teams, <laughs> football clubs, football programs. <laughs> programs. That's the word I was looking for. Uh, uh, we're talking about how much money football programs bring into the school, mm-hmm. like a crazy amount of money. And most of that money is going to PWIs, but most of the people playing are black. Exactly. exactly. So it's, you know. So let me ask you this question. You have a son. He's ready to, to go to school. He has, um, you know, all of these people clamoring at his doorstep because he's just so good at football. We're going to say football. No, let's say basketball. Basketball, like this guy. He's a McDonald's all-star. That's a thing, All-American. Right? Close. All-American. Close. McDonald's <laughs> all-American. 
so <laughs> at least I had my fast food chain, right? Okay. A McDonald's all American. And, um, this could be his big next step. And it really comes down to five schools are in the running and it is, I said basketball, right? So it's going to be Duke, Carolina, um, a Kentucky, Kentucky, Connecticut, and Howard. Where are you sending him? Where's the push? I mean, it's hard to say because if he is a McDonald's All-American and he's one of these five-star recruits, he's likely, people are going to be watching him regardless. Mm -hmm. It's not like he doesn't have any platform to play on. You know, there's tournaments and, and things of that nature for HBCUs too. Um, I mean, the NBA recruits people from overseas, so they've got their finger on the pulse for the most part. Um, it's just that... I just what, go ahead. I just feel like when you're talking about sports, like it just becomes a whole different conversation. Like athletes, when we were in school, they it didn't matter if they had a good education because, and I'm not saying HBCs, you don't get a good education, but 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 I guess I'm like if you are going as an athlete, like. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's always been the the whole like debate about athletes is that they go, they don't, it doesn't matter if they have people who go to class for them, you know, like they're just there to perform their sport and bring the, bring the, the, the school money. So yes, I think it's, I think it's a great um, vehicle with which to expose, you know, whatever school that kid decided to go to, but I feel like we're moving away from the fundamental conversation of like, yeah, I don't know about if one is better or, or not. Um, Fair. But I think the oh, point I that I was trying, I think the point that I was going for is you would likely send him to one of the four schools that I mentioned before the fifth school, which would be the HBCU because of the exposure that they would get, the opportunities that would be presented to them. And I think that like when you are, coming up and getting ready to go to, deciding on what school to go to. There, there's, like, you want to enjoy all of the history that Monique is talking about. I know, I know for myself, when trying to decide, like, what schools to go to, I was, I mean, after watching the Cosby show and A Different World and seeing Hillman, like, how could you not want to do it? But then I had friends that went to, I, I won't name any schools because they'll know and I know that they're listeners, but they just, it took them longer. It took them longer. And it, the longer it wasn't because they weren't smart. The longer wasn't because of anything. The longer was because they didn't, it was such a struggle like financially but, but that's then but that's that's why we moved over to the about or the conversation about the athletes because we cannot act like that is not a a serious money um uh, uh revenue to the schools mm. so we right, don't so support like the hbcu we the community in the in the large sense of the way like the same we, we the same way we want our best and our brightest to go to the best and brightest school well because of the way the system is set up the best and brightest schools are the so are the pwis the best school for basketball is the pwi and until we start pushing our best and brightest our smartest our best ball players to the uh, HBCUs to where the money is going to it. Like a lot of people who go to HBCUs are like first time, you know, first people in their families to go to college and they're scraping and scrimping and trying to get, and that's not to say that same people don't go to PBWIs, but if if you have a school where 80% of those people are, are, are on financial aid, but then in a PWI where, you know, maybe it's, you know, not a, as large a number. It's, you know, the comparison, the money revenue that goes into those schools is just so different. And until we worry about the system that makes that so, then. Hmm. Yeah, so I think that if, I think most people would agree that HBCUs are something that we need to build up and that we need to invest in and that, like that, that to me feels like, yeah, I mean, it feels like a whole different conversation. Like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, sh should HBCUs exist? Yes. Should 
we try to build them up so that they are just as good and it doesn't seem like you're having to trade off something to go there. Absolutely. Right. Um, and I, and I think it always is that debate of like, but is my child going to be depending on what my child needs? Right. Cause I think, you know, that experience, depending on who your child is, 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 is what the child needs. Right. Mm -hmm. But like I have a public school up the street from me, that's a two out of 10 mm. on, in like, you know, greatschools.org or whatever. Um, and in my head, I'm like, okay, when I have kids, am I going to send my kid to that private school? Knowing that, or public school, public knowing school, that yeah. it's going to take people in the community to build it up. And it probably would take a mother like me to like, you know, pour into the school to make it, make it worthwhile and get the resources on all that stuff. But, but you're going to be that, tired. Then, would you say? But you're going to be tired. And so I'm just wondering, like, I think that's, that's, I and think I, what I'm wondering I about in HBC. To, I also don't want us to paint the brush that a, that going to an HBCU is a subpar education. I think that there are, there are wonderful professors. There are wonderful staff. There are wonderful small classroom settings that you get at a HBCU. And I think that, um, and I think that all HBCUs are not the same, just like all PWIs are not the same. So to paint them as like, you know what I mean? Like the, the narrative that that means that you're gonna, you're gonna get a subpar um, education. Now, there may be uh, different um, networks, you know, that you're, you're able to like tap into if you're, if you're going to school and, and, and you're the son of, you know, this tech company or whatever is going right. to the same school as you're going to. Well then sure. But there also is network and connection and community and HBCUs that cannot, that cannot be underestimated. Well, and I think also the HBCUs get a bad rap because kind of like your public school down the street, I never put much stock in greatschools.org because mostly they just look at test scores and um that never really tells the whole story mm. and so hbcus because we know there are inherent biases in these standardized tests and we know there are inherent biases in primary education mm. so grades don't look the same like gpas don't look the same and sat scores and act scores don't look the same for students in coming into hbcus as they do PWIs, just based on, as Monique said, the systematic racism that, you know, causes all, all the <laughs> things that are All happening. the ails of the world. <laughs> right. So, um, so I think that people will look at that and be like, oh, well, look at the caliber of student going to an HBCU. Clearly, it must be a subpar education when it's very often not. So, so how, how do we have, how do we, how do you, how does one who's trying to make a decision mm -hmm. about schools, how, how then, how else, what else do we have in order to say whether the education is on par or not? Like if other than something like a ranking or like, and, but if we're trying to say we're throwing that all of that out, then what else do we have? I like think you go mouth or? for what yeah. you have to go for what is important and what is driving for you. Mm -hmm. It was never to me. It was never. I didn't even apply to any PW. Oh, I did apply to one, and it was a pretty good school, and I got into it. But I never even thought that I was gonna go. Like it wasn't even. You know, it was like a throwaway situation. Right. Um, because what was important to me was that I had that kind of a, um experience, and I knew what a college, what I wanted college to look like. Mm -hmm. And I wanted them to, you know, so that they had the, um, the, the, the major that I, that I wanted to go to. And, you know, like, so they just, it depends on what's important to you and what you're looking for. So if, if to you, it's important that they rank the top, then, then that's what you go for. And that's, and that's cool. But for a lot of other people, that's just not, or that's not even in their, 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 um, like, in their reach to to get to so they're still you know everybody can't get into the top two and three schools yeah and I think Monique's right it's what's important to you so my son's 15 he's going into the 10th grade um and so we're starting to have these college conversations and you know he always has wanted to go to Carolina because you know I raised my kid a Carolina fan mm -hmm. um but I asked him recently I said would you ever consider going to an HBCU 
And he said, yeah, I think I'm going to think about it. Um, and for me, it's not because I think he'll get a better or worse education at either one. It's more so I know what school he goes to now, which is a very small, classical, private school. Right. Um, and so they're not really teaching from a perspective of blackness, to say the least, mm -hmm. um, even though the student body is, is pretty diverse. Um, so I think for, and me being, you know, a biracial girl who was raised by a white lady, it's hard for me to like infuse black culture into his life. I try, I try, but it's hard. So it's even appealing to me, not necessarily considering from an, any sort of academic perspective, it's more right. just like a cultural perspective, knowing, I mean, people heard our conversation about college anyway. So knowing how we kind of feel about <laughs> if college is, you know, still necessary or not, <laughs> just like having that, having that experience, him getting those perspectives that I'm just not able to provide. And then how valuable do I consider that versus, oh, he can take communications at Carolina or whatever, you know what I mean? So right. it's, it's just so funny. what yeah. you prioritize. It's so funny because I, so I went to predominantly white um, high school and middle school and elementary school and everything. Um, and going to Carolina, I was like, whoa. Look at all these black people. <laughs> Look at all these. And they like me, they like me. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah. I'm That's important. It's also important to know that age most HBCUs have a diverse campus. They are predominantly black people, but there are lots of people from other countries, from other cultures. Uh, I know my school, we had a bunch of like people from Spain that were there. And so like, you know, there's, there's, there's mixes and you just got to go for what's important for you. That's I think fine. that's it. Yeah. I agree. So speaking of, I guess, being prepared for the real world and entering the working world. Uh -huh. um, I know I work in a corporate environment. Um, Stacia works in a corporate environment. We, we all work in an office somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. Um, do you feel that you have to be a representative? Yes. Of, okay. Every day. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> let me no. let you finish your question. <laughs> I'm going to let you finish. Um, yes. Do you feel like you have to be a representative of your race in terms of code switching, in terms of not being too ethnic in the office and things of that nature? Yes. Yes, Leanna. Okay. And it's effing exhausting. <laughs> it is. It's exhausting. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I would love, like, I remember every time I think about, like, a, basically every corporate job I've started, I've started with my hair one way, which was, which I deemed acceptable to the masses. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, the masses, tired. not the masses. <laughs> but you know what? But you know what? Kind of <laughs> works both ways. <laughs> both ways. Siobhan, when I laughed, this exactly, it was exactly, it was exactly ex what we thought. I knew exactly <laughs> what was in your head. <laughs> I knew it. But yes, exactly. And then at some point, as Black women are wont to do, I was like, I'm ready to change my hair, right? Mm -hmm. And then the amount of like thought that went in through my head, oh, how long has it been since I've had this 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 hairstyle what if I should I change to something that's kind of similar to what I just had are there going to be a whole bunch of questions is it going to stop my upward mobility is it going to be too black you know like right. can I go from uh so into just you know my natural hair out like and literally are you had gonna have to explain weave to white people am I gonna have to explain yes exactly <laughs> and tell them how long it took and how I went from one length to another length and and like, and then, and do it all with a smile without rolling my eyes, mm, mm -hmm. you know? And it, I think I just rolled my eyes just then. It's exhausting. I, I mean, it's <laughs> exhausting. And I know, I feel like I've had conversations with all of you as I come out of the first day after changing my hair and I'm like, oh, it went well, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> like, I think, I think I'm still going to get that promotion. It'll be mm -hmm. fine. 
which yeah. and I'll take responsibility for some of that as well just the like even putting stock in that you know like feeling like I have to placate the masses <laughs> um but but yeah no absolutely always feel like I'm the representative in the room because more likely than not like I am one of few one of few black women black per people you know one of few women mm -hmm. um yeah absolutely I have the um I don't want to say pleasure, but because of my field, I hear the coded words that people say mm. that give it all the, everything that I think I know is real. Um, people say things like, oh, um, this person is so spirited. No, spirit is not really a good one. Let me think of something. Oh, she, she's, she has so much passion or, mm -hmm. um, I'm not really sure that she's a cultural fit for the organization mm -hmm. or, um, you know, I'm not really sure, um, how she is not pre presents. Oh gosh. It's it, but it's something like presents. Executive uh, presence. Or her something. presence, her presence isn't exactly what we would be looking for, um, for somebody like X, Y, Z. And there's never very much to back it up, but you can always take a look and you can always see a similarity. Of what All this is. is she's too black. All mm -hmm. of this is code for she's too black for what we need. She's mm -hmm. too unrefined for what mm -hmm. we need. And so it definitely plays with your head and you feel, you, you don't just feel, you know, you can't be yourself if you're trying to get to a different, a different space or a different level. And you even have to bring down like how, how you feel. I was, um, I was listening to a call and, and um, Siobhan, I think you know what I'm talking about, where the person who was talking, they were very much like, if, if I say too much to, if I say too much, then I'm angry. Mm -hmm. If I don't say enough, then, you know, I don't have, I don't have what it takes. Yeah. Um, and there were some other little things in there, but like, you have to like walk this very fine line. And in the end, you're still underpaid yeah. <laughs> and you're right. still undervalued. And right. that's real. That's not, that's not in your head. Mm -hmm. It's not make I, this is one thing that I don't really have much uh, any uh, experience with because I went to all black elementary school, all black middle school, <laughs> all black high school, but to all black college. And then now I work in an industry where all black people are around me. So I have like kind of the opposite. Like we have, uh, I think one white person in my office. She's my homegirl. She's listening. I hear you. Hey, what's up? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, she's like the one, like everybody else around me is always black. So we don't have that. We, sh my coworker comes with her hair this long one day, this long the next. And we, nobody doesn't bat an eye, blue hair, red hair, pink hair, does, nobody cares. And it's just a different, a whole different feeling. We don't have those same kind of, and, and we have different cultures. We have Haitians, we have Nigerians, we have all good kind of blacks. <laughs> so I don't. <laughs> I, this is something I just can't relate to. I hear right. when, when I hear you guys talking about it, I'm like, what? Why? <laughs> I never, I'm like always really like, wet your hair, blow your afro out. <laughs> Tell them kiss your butt. You still are awesome. You do your job well and they need to applaud you. But then you guys are like, no, 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 I'm gonna eat stuff. <laughs> 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 so I mean yeah. it sucks. I hate that you guys have to deal with that. And it just doesn't seem like we should have to, like in 2020. Um, I I find it the hardest. And this is a little more specific to me when things like George Floyd happens, or I mean, dating even back to Trayvon Martin, to Freddie Gray, to, you know, nameless, there no, numerous, numerous times that a Black person has been killed um, by police or by anyone else. Mm -hmm. And as a Black person, you know, it's exhausting to just feel that way and then feel like you have to go to work and then feel like to explain to them like why it's important and why like, they should- Like why it's not okay to kill a 12 year old. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, or, or, or 
they're walking around like nothing happened and you're just feeling devastated on the mm-hmm. inside. And I think for me, um, and obviously I cannot speak for all black women because I am not an all black woman, mm-hmm. but I think that people sometimes forget that I am like half black and, and these issues do affect me in a way. And so therefore I don't, like I feel compelled to speak on it. If someone's racist, I'm gonna speak. I mean, obviously anyone should speak on it if they're racist, but like right. to, I feel a lot of times since I am a woman of color in an IT space a lot of the time um, or digital space that I need to be vocal about these issues. But then I feel conflicted because I don't want to pretend like I am a representative for black people because I don't have the same black experience yeah. as other people. Um, and I don't want to like take up space and take up air and like take away from other voices that need to be speaking on it. Um, but I think that's the fundamental issue always when you're the one person of color mm-hmm. in the room is that yeah. your experience can never be representative of all black anything or all anything Mm -hmm. and so then it's it's you you, like you know I don't I don't know about this which maybe that's you know part of what we're talking about is like how you know how black are you and you know Mm -hmm. like how close to whatever like how close are you to getting your card revoked but like all of our experiences are unique and and we all it's like you always still feel the pressure to to be (laughs) the representative be the voice of like, okay, well, let me look to my left and my right. Okay, nobody else is going to say anything. Mm. So I, I guess I got to, you know, I guess I got to speak up and say, no, it's okay that he had on that sweatshirt. Like you can right. walk through a neighborhood with a sweatshirt and Skittles and like you have a right to get home safely. Like, you right. know? Yeah. yeah. Doesn't matter what he did in the past. It doesn't matter. Get yeah. Candace Owens, it doesn't matter that he was on drugs. Right. <laughs> Like, it's ridiculous. Like, it's murder people who are on drugs. <laughs> yeah. Not okay. We, we, there, there'd be a problem with the, the opioid addiction because that is affecting white people a lot. And if they were just murdering people who are on opioids who were not people of color, there would be a whole different story. Yeah. Right. Monique, I really resent what you just said. Why? And I completely disagree with you. Don't you understand that the opioid, <laughs> that is a health crisis. Oh, right. <laughs> not, a, a health, not a drug problem. Not a drug problem. That's a health crisis. <laughs> health crisis. Meanwhile, I, I was a I was a child of the '80s, born in I was in Brooklyn during the crack era. That's so that was nowhere near a health crisis. That it was, was a, a war. war. It was a war. <laughs> the whole war. Yeah. I don't understand why you don't see the difference. Yeah. I don't understand. So it's hard so for me clear. to see it. Yeah. It's really black and white, honestly. <laughs> oh, so <okay>. clear. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. So clear. <laughs> Perfect. So I guess then it brings up an interesting question because again, um, as a mixed person, everyone always would say, well, you know, you're black, you have a full black parent. Some would say that and others would say, uh, you're not black, you're biracial, you have a full white parent, like don't you know, act like you represent black people. And so I've always had this question in my mind of what is the definition of black? I mean, black is sort of a social construct, like race isn't a real scientific thing, right? Like mm. you can have a nationality, you can have an ethnicity, um, but race isn't a thing. It was a made up thing to you know, fuel white supremacy, basically. And what defines blackness in America? Having at least watched a considerable amount of like the Cosby show and being able to quote some lines from it. That's that has to rank somewhere up there. You want it to have big boobs. <laughs> or you know that is like the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but you in this world, I'll take you out. Oh you go. I don't I feel on this spot. Siobhan, now. I haven't heard a quote from the Cosby show from you. Oh you just did it. You just did it. I started it. You true. That's true. <laughs> so like in this, in this, in this, like 
um, equation, like Monique would be losing. She would be coming yes. in behind for her. I mean, hey, listen, my dad something. always used to tell me <laughs> that I overcompensate my blackness because I'm so light skinned. So mm. <laughs> that's why she went to all those black schools. So I'm like black. <laughs> so I'm like black and black. Give me the big hair. I want it all. Yeah. My Afro big and I want an Afro pick. Mm -hmm. yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Bamboo earrings. At least yeah, two at least two pairs. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I don't know. I think we just spend too much time on this. It, and I think it really is just the thing that was in, imputed in us since slavery of trying to figure out who's black and who's not. And with the whole one drop rule, right? Mm -hmm. You have mm -hmm. one drop of blackness, one drop right. of bl uh, black blood that makes you black. The whole idea of that is like that one drop of black blood makes you dirty and, and undesirable. However, you could be fully half white, but somehow that blackness still messed you up. So I think it's, I think the whole idea of it is just kind of um, ridiculous. If the person is black, you know, they have a parent that's black or even a grandparent that's black and they like to say that they... You know, they I, I identify that way. And uh, I, I don't think that we can put it into a, a little box because then we start, we start limiting it. And so I basically, like, like okay. are you saying, like, if you think you're Black, you are Black? Well, you're gonna you're gonna bring up that lady I know Rachel Dolezal. Rachel Dolezal. <laughs> I know. I, I know. I, I just I just I was because based off of what you just said, I would I think there's. A real, I did I say really you have a black parent or a grandparent that was black. I did say that. Okay, I mean, so here we go. Here's the here then. Case in point. I'll mm -hmm. use a personal example. Uh, my sister. Shout out to my sister. She better be listening. Um, <laughs> has a daughter who. Um, one parent is half black, half white. One parent is half white, half Cambodian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This little girl looks white, okay? Mm -hmm. She is whitey, white, white. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she will have white privilege. She will have no one ever questioning her bone straight hair. I mean, she is a white baby. I love her to death, but she's a white baby. Mm -hmm. Um, Not to say I wouldn't love her. <laughs> I'm just I, saying, mean, like, I, I, just, I didn't want to sound like I was disparaging her for being like a white right, right. but you know she we know you she, love your niece we I, know. Do. I do I do um so I kind of feel like if she grows up and is like I'm black people will come for her because people come for me they're like you're not don't say you're black because you're not black you're mixed that's what you are like that's its own thing and that's what you are uh, but I think that's so, I think that's so unfair. If you, I understand that you, if you wanted to say that you were black, I think that you would have the right to say so. And then if you were like, I, I don't understand why we, we try to, I just think it's because we have so little, like as a people, as, as far as a culture is, because our culture was stripped away from us from Africa, right. that we just want to hold on to this, like black, like we want to decide who gets it and who doesn't. I, it's ridiculous. I used to I used to get teased all the time in in like elementary school because I was light and I had light eyes. And they would be like, "Your your daddy's your dad's white. Is your dad really white?" If you see my mom, you know whatever. They didn't see my dad. They think that I was white, a half mm -hmm. white. And I and I'd be like, "No, why? It's we come in all different shades. Like stop trying to identify and put people in boxes. Say I'm right. black and black. Leave me alone." I think that you should have the right to identify as you identify and no one should question it. And, you know, to quote a philosopher, Carlton Banks, mm -hmm. like you're mm -hmm. out here running the same race, race that everybody else is. Like, it's not something that you're trying to be is who you are. Um, because when people look at you, they're, there's going to be an automatic assumption, whether or not it's like, oh, she's black mixed with whatever. If they're the type of person that thinks that there's an inferiority that comes with it, they're going to think that regardless. Um, and I just think that, but for our our own self and our own people, I think that we need to like be very mindful that identity is something that only you can give to yourself. Like, like mm -hmm. you have to identify for yourself. Other people yeah. can't identify for you. And, um, and whatever you say, like there needs to be a respect for it. That's how mm -hmm. I feel. Yeah. I, I think, I think because historically there have been so few representations of blackness, mm -hmm. like, there've only been, you know, the gangster, the mammy, you know, there've only been like 
five representations of what black is then that was the definition of what black is Mm -hmm. and i think the more and more we start seeing like you know black people that are not in this box the weird emo skater kid yeah right (laughs) the wider and wider the definition of what black is will become and the freer Mm -hmm. we will be to be able to just be ourselves yes and that's so great whatever that is That's so great because then the more we are just like, we're not some other thing. We are all people. Yeah. Right. And like people could start to realize that if if black is not this like. Yeah. And you no longer, we will no longer feel the pressure to be the representation because, you know, you've seen a black president, you've seen a black drug dealer, you've seen, you know, you've seen a black chef, like you've seen the full array of what a person can be. Um, and you've seen it all as a black person and then no longer is it like just one thing mm-hmm. right interesting interesting conversation you guys um man i was gonna talk about other racist stuff but <laughs> <laughs> no leah um, you made me think of it when you said that um you know these kind of portrayals of thugs and mammies have been sort of the representation um, social representation of Black people. So are there things that you guys, thinking specifically when you said Mammy of Aunt Jemima, are there things that you guys remember from growing up that were racist, mm-hmm. but you didn't really realize at the time? Like now you're kind of like, hey, that was, that was racist. Um, but you didn't realize. The, the pride that we felt for the OJ verdict. <laughs> <laughs> that one. I remember specifically, I have a real specific memory. Um, I was raised um, primarily by my aunts. And I remember that um, I was in one town when it started. And then we had moved to another town. This is where Monique and I picked up and met, um, which was predominantly Black. So I was in more of a multicultural space. You already know I was in the Black, 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 Black. black (laughs) And then I moved to this pretty predominantly Black school. And I just remember saying out loud, because I didn't know that I shouldn't say this out loud to my family, OJ did it. And I remember my aunt looking at me and um, I really think she said, like, if you think he did it, then you're not black. (laughs) I think that happened. I think that happened at home. Okay. Joe Biden. (laughs) (laughs) Right. I think that happened at home. And I was like, okay, there's a board that I need to be on and I'm not on it. So let me like, let me jump on board and then, you know, forget what the evidence is saying and, and uh, say, no, he's, the juices. The juices. Stacia, do you, okay. So Stacia and I went to the same high school already established yeah. when the OJ verdict came out, they, every TV in the building was in a classroom. The roller we carts. Either, the, we rolled yeah. them on the roller carts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were either in a classroom or they were gathered in, in like all the big, like the library, we went to a really mm-hmm. big school. So the library, the, um, the the auditorium like everywhere there was groups of people waiting for the very and when it came out not guilty i mean i it was in we rushed the commons rushed into the commons we rushed into the to where all the lockers and the hallways and everybody <laughs> flooded and like our white teachers <laughs> teachers were in tears honey and we were like yes, yes! he's free he's free <laughs> it was it was crazy. I mean, we were all rejoicing. Yeah, no, I remember rejoicing. And I remember it didn't, none, like, it's so funny. Now, like, all those documentaries <laughs> came out, right? Yeah, yeah. And, like, like now I'm paying more attention to the, like, the facts or whatever, the facts. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, like, he, he, this man was very guilty. Very, <laughs> he was, very guilty. He was very guilty. But I remember not giving not one damn. One, not nobody, one damn. Nobody cared about Back then. the fact that he was guilty. No. Not, it didn't matter. It did not matter. It did not matter. We was like, this is a win for us. Yeah. All the times yes. y'all uh, <laughs> killed us and got away with it. <laughs> this one is ours. The yes. juice is loose. It's so ridiculous now when I think about it. It's like, but honestly, about that. But no. honestly, guys, it's one like, oh, because because something real happened there, and I don't want to discard like that. Something really real happened, and and so we're gonna put that there. 
But something real happens every day when people who murder our children and our men go free. And so even though I'm like, yeah, he did it, I might have a better understanding now of what my aunt meant when she was talking to me because it really is like we fi finally something for us. Right. A, they've been getting away with it for so long. Right. Finally, we're able to take their same rules and apply it to, for us. Okay, so the OJ verdict is one thing. I yeah. remember when I learned that there were more verses to the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, that's disappointing. And that the second verses uh, talk about uh, slaves to the mm -hmm. slave owner or the slaves and the wild thing and the slave or whatever it is. I was like, so they just like, they just stopped having to sing that part. Right? <laughs> it's still the basis of like our country or that we were written into the constitution as um, a fraction of a person. Right. As black people, yeah. So, like all those things, you know, as a kid, it, I mean, we learned it. I didn't learn right. about the Star Spangled Banner, but the Constitution. And I was like, okay, this is what it was. And you kind of learn it just on an academic level. Right. And then, it like, glazed like, over. Yeah. And then it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. We were right. straight up not whole people. So, every July 4th, my family would go to Stone Mountain, which mm -hmm. is this huge mountain in Georgia. And on the side, it has carved um, some Confederate soldiers, like Andrew Jackson and Robert E. Lee, um, and mm -hmm. one other one. And we would, we would go every July 4th, like we would pack up a little like picnic mm -hmm. and we would take the blanket out and we would put it down and be surrounded by mm -hmm. the community. And then, you know, when the, the, the sun went down, the, the, the laser show would begin and the laser show had them like reanimate these Confederate soldiers. And then they were like on their horses, like, <laughs> like riding know, again, riding again. Okay? <laughs> wow. and then, they then, live, <laughs> they live, their, oh, they wow. live again and they're, wow. they're uh, you know, let's try they're to fight this infamy. war again and see if it turns out <laughs> And and then we would all stand up and sing, I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know. And I mean, this I'm is free like... unless I'm black because they want me back in slavery. <laughs> I love that, that was they did this for the 4th of July, too. It's like the Confederacy was not a 4th of July thing. No. Like, that has nothing to do with the Anytime the we can celebrate the Confederacy, we will. I mean, I guess so. Mm, I, guess I look so. back on that and I'm like, oh. <laughs> what's the oh. what's the Georgia flag? Did the Georgia flag ever have the Dixie flag in there? It did have the Confederate flag in there, and mm. I think in maybe two thousand or sometime recently, um, um, they voted and people were upset, um, mm -hmm. and they they finally took it down. Um, and I think that just happened in like, Alabama like two days ago, right? Yeah, just something <laughs> like that, like five minutes ago. Yeah, yeah five minutes right ago. before we. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's funny because I. <laughs> Speaking of the Confederate flag, I used to watch the Dukes of Hazard when I was little. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we went to the beach, I think in, I, I guess it might have been in South Carolina, one of the South Carolina beaches when I was really young. And um, we were in one of those stores that sells all the things like the bathing suits and the snow globes and mm. the bongs <laughs> and like one of those big stores. <laughs> And there was this giant floating raft that had a huge Confederate flag on it. And like, I just remember yelling out in the middle of the store, you're like, mom, can I get this raft? Like, hold like, can I get this raft? <laughs> and I know people, although it was South Carolina, so maybe not. But like, <laughs> get that, get that little colored baby on that Confederate. <laughs> I'm sure my mom was mortified. Like, no, to me, it was like the Dukes of Hazard rap. Right. Like, mm -hmm. It was the Dukes of Hazard car. Right. And she, I'm sure she was like, <laughs> snatch her kid up and run out the store real quick. Right. I didn't get no. it. I did no. not get the rap. Okay, good. I didn't. Good job, mom. Good yeah. job, mom. <laughs> you know what else I didn't realize was um, racist growing up was when people would say to me, You're so articulate. 
Oh my gosh. Mm. <laughs> I didn't realize that. I thought it was a compliment. Mm-hmm. In my effing existence. Yeah, but then yep. the older I got, the more I realized that to say you are so articulate probably applies to like maybe a, I don't know, a two year old perhaps. Other than that, <laughs> like what else should I be? <laughs> Right. You're what reading else? at two and most people read at three or four or five or however old, six. Right. That's something to be impressed by. But when you Me being are... a grown person, you would think I'm able to pull together words. <laughs> whole right. sentence. Syntax, sentences, grammar. Yeah. I know where to put a comma on occasion. I'm talking about some, some heavy stuff a little bit, <laughs> kind of. A lot. It was a it was a feast tonight. Yes. Um, talking about blackness. So if you don't mind just switching gears, maybe like lighten it up. Continue the experience on our social media handles at the Confab Experience.